Welcome friends for yet another session of NDS. Yesterday we have seen the overview of Indian accounting standards and its applicability. And today the second of its series is presentation of financial statements as per NDS. This is covered by means of NDS 1. And we should also have a quick look on Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013 because the format of the financial statement has been prescribed by that particular schedule. And accordingly, every company which is preparing the financial statement as per NDS should also ensure compliance with the format given in Schedule 3 to the Companies Act. So let's go into the standard. The overall consideration for preparation of a financial statement, as you are aware, that every company prepares the financial statement on a going concern assumption. That means the company is not planning to curtail its operations on a significant basis, or the company is not planning to shut down its operations within the next 12 months from the end of the reporting period. This is the basic assumption and fundamental assumption in preparation of the financial statement. In case, if this going concern assumption is disturbed by means of facts and circumstances of the case, the financial statement cannot be prepared on a going concern assumption. That means it cannot be presented on the normal historical cost convention plus the fair value measurement as and when it is required by the standards. It has to be prepared on a liquidation basis. That's the reason why this going concern assumption is very important. As an auditor, this going concern assumption is assuming further significance because the SA 700 revised specifically requires an auditor to comment in a separate paragraph, is there any material uncertainty relating to going concern? If so, how it has been considered in the preparation of the financial statement? So the fundamental assumption in the financial statement is going concern. It goes without saying because double entry uh, bookkeeping is being maintained, accrual basis of accounting is an important aspect. Every accounting standards are driven by the concept of materiality. Trivial items are, can be aggregated and presented as a single line item on the concept of materiality so that the financial statement will contain only relevant and reliable information rather than giving excessive information if the concept of materiality is ignored and due to that there is no aggregation of items to be shown on the financial statements. Another important aspect NDS is talking about is that whether an asset and a liability or an income or expenditure should be shown on a gross basis or it should be given on a net basis. That's what we call it as an offsetting. For example, I have a financial asset. I also have a financial liability. Both of them are covered by India's 109. Can I show on a net basis? In, in simple terms, I have trade receivable as well as trade payable. If I net it off, the net trade receivable shows a debit balance. Can I show that? The standard is very categorical that unless the company has a legal right to set off, it is not possible for them to set off. And the Preparation of the financial statements requires a consistent application of the applicable accounting standards. So India should be consistently applied for the preparation and also the way in which the presentation and disclosures made, uh, how it has been classified and presented in the previous year, whether that has been shown again in the consistent manner in the current year or it has been reclassified. If it is reclassified, what is the additional requirement that is also coming as part of that? You may aware that every financial statement should have a comparative 
statement. That means the company should have at least one year comparative for the user to understand what is the current year number and what was in the previous year so that he can make a relationship out of what is the variance and whether the variance has been supported by the facts and circumstances relating to the particular company. So the comparative information is always a crucial aspect for understanding the financial statement. One of the very, very important point as far as the index is concerned is that the company has to make an explicit and unreserved compliance of NDAs, which is applicable for the particular company. And if that particular compliance statement has not been made, it has been mentioned in the standard that the standard, the financial statements are not considered to be an NDAs financial statement. So compliance with the NDAs without any reservation and the compliance should be made explicit as part of the notes and accounts is an important aspect of the financial statement. As you are aware that NDAs is concentrating on the balance sheet approach. How the asset or a liability is fairly presented and if there is a change in the value of the asset and liability, what is the consequential impact on the profit and loss account is what NDAs is looking for. Whereas under IGAP, we normally go by the profit and loss account approach. What is the income or expenditure to be recognized and what is the corresponding asset or liability which we should consider. That is, an import, that is the biggest change which we have to see when we are comparing NDAs with IGAP. So we are going for a balance sheet approach under NDAs whereas it's just a P&L approach under IGAP. This is the overall consideration when a company prepares its financial statement according to NDAs. Now, let's move on to understand what is the linkage between NDAs 1 and the Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. For your understanding, IAS 1 under IFRS is also talking about preparation and presentation of financial statements under IFRS, but it never gave any specific format for the balance sheet, profit and loss count, cash flow statement, statement of changes in equity or notes and accounts. It is only giving a illustrative items to be covered in the balance sheet, p &L, etc. Whereas here the NDAs has been notified under section 133 of the Companies Act 2013 and accordingly the preparation of the financial statement should also be in line with Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. If you recollect that normal companies to whom NDAs are not applicable will prepare as per Division 1 of Schedule 3. So Division 1 applicable to normal companies to whom NDAs is not at all applicable. In case if these companies are normal companies, when I am using the word normal companies, I am not considering specific industry specific companies. For example, NBFC I am not considering here. Normal companies to whom NDAs is applicable are supposed to prepare as per Division 2 of Schedule 3. We will discuss the format of Division 2 in this presentation throughout because NDAs 1 is talking about presentation of financial statement and the format has been prescribed by Division 2 of Schedule 3. And thirdly, if it is an NBFC to whom NDAs is applicable, then Division 3 of Schedule 3 is applicable. Uh, for this particular presentation, I am using the format given for normal companies and not for NBFCs. Maybe as part of this series, I will take one session on industry specific standards and industry specific issues. And at that time, maybe I will cover Division 3 of Schedule 3, which is for NBFCs adopting NDAs. Having seen that there is a linkage between NDAs 1 and the format of Schedule 3, Division 2, let us go into the components which has been prescribed for a financial statement. And of course, it is not uh, something new 
majority of us already knew this and even students will also understand this that we are preparing this financial statements and the components of financial statement from time immemorial there are some small changes which we will uh, see in the slides to come balance sheet is the first component of financial statement and of course the second one is statement of profit and loss third is the statement of cash flows fourth is the new element under nds i gap we just prepare balance sheet statement of profit and loss account statement of cash flows and notes and accounts and of course we have notes and accounts under nds as well but an important or a new element which comes in is statement of changes in equity under nds we will see each of these components at length and also discuss the practical issues which may arise when we prepare the financial statements or the components of financial statement under nds <laughs> one important aspect the nomenclature used to buy IFRS under IAS 1 for the components of financial statements are little different. For example, the balance sheet is considered a statement of financial position. So that means it talks about what is the position as on a particular date. The statement of profit and loss account is called a statement of financial performance. So what is the performance of the company during the year or during the period? A statement of cash flows remaining the same statement of changes in equity remaining the same notes and accounts remaining the same so with, by using a different nomenclature like balance sheet or statement of profit and loss account are we are deviating completely from ifrs the answer is no because iasb has permitted the comp the countries to use different nomenclature which might have been used by them as long as it continues to give the same understanding of the specific components of financial statement so for our discussion we will only have what is the name nomenclature or name which has been used commonly under indias another important aspect which we have to consider is that the standard says all the components of the financial statement must be presented with equal prominence what does it mean for example my balance sheet is very strong so i give the balance sheet in a different prominence maybe i have highlighted i have given in a different font and i have given in a large font size etc whereas my performance during the year is not great and my statement of profit and loss account shows some sort of losses or something like that so if a company thinks that by giving in a smaller font or in a different format without any highlights it can do that so here my understanding of this is all the components of the financial statement must be presented with the equal prominence that means everything should be presented equally with the same prominence you cannot have highlight for one component and you should not do it uh, without any highlight for the other component so it should have prominence in fact i used to tell my team when you are having the financial statement under indias in excel format please ensure to the when you are setting your page setup for the purposes of printing give this same size for example 80% of the the uh, excel sheet should be printed maintain that 80% for balance sheet profit and loss account cash flow statement notes and account changes and equity etc etc so that's the way in which uh, we are taking more conservative approach because of this particular statement let's move on to the balance sheet under indias interestingly the format of the balance sheet under indias is not different with that of a company which is not following igap when i am saying the format of the balance sheet 
I'm just trying to say that the format requires the assets to be disclosed as non-current asset and current asset. The liability should be disclosed as non-current liabilities, current liabilities and equity. This is a normal requirement which has to be done for the purposes of presentation of a balance sheet. As I told already, India is one is not at all talking about the format of the financial statement. The format actually comes from Schedule 3 to the Companies Act 2013. So when we are saying the format is coming from Schedule 3 to the Companies Act, the important aspect which I have to see is that whether the format is in accordance with the requirement given for India's companies, that is what we have said, Division 2. For you to understand, I just open a financial statement, especially balance sheet, to understand how the structure comes in with respect to asset side as well as the liability side as per Schedule 3, Division 2, applicable to normal India's companies. This is an Excel spreadsheet which has been prepared for uh, one of the client, which is a public listed entity. And accordingly, sharing this doesn't, uh, this information is already available. And accordingly, you can understand that uh, how the financial statements are structured. Let me just take you through the finance balance sheet. If you see, the balance sheet says that it is a balance sheet prepared and it starts with assets normally under schedule 3 applicable to normal companies under IGAP you might have seen that the share capital comes as the first item in the balance sheet whereas here the assets are presented first and that too non-current asset and then current asset and according to the various requirements current and non-current asset, then the total assets, there is a subtotal of uh, non-current asset and subtotal of uh, current assets and then goes to your total asset. Then comes what we call the liability side or maybe I should use the word equity and liability side. So the equity comes first and interestingly you can see equity share capital is shown separately other equity is shown separately. Let us understand this little bit later. And total equity is shown as a subtotal. Then you have liabilities. Under liabilities, you have non-current liabilities, which again have a subtotal. And you have current liabilities, which also has a subtotal. Then the total liabilities as a subtotal. Then the total equity and liabilities as an overall total. Let us take a quick view of the various components of the or various line items of this assets and liability statement. For example, if you see that if I am talking about a balance sheet, what does it mean? I am talking about balance sheet with non-current asset. So we should understand what do you mean by current asset and what do you mean by non-current asset. So we will discuss further in this. And interestingly, the financial statement has been given with two comparatives, March 31st, 2019, March 31st, 2018, and as well as you have April 1, 2017. Uh, there is a reason behind this. For the first time adopter, the Comparatives for the date of transition is also required to be given. So this is the first year of compliance with India's by one of the companies. So naturally, they are supposed to give the third balance sheet. We will discuss the, about the third balance sheet. I'm using the word third balance sheet. We'll understand what you mean by third balance sheet when we are talking about the notes and accounts and the presentation of financial statement. Within the non-current asset, if you see property plan equipment, capital work in progress, and of course, this company doesn't have intangible assets, otherwise it might have come. Then the third important category comes as a financial asset. In IGAP, there is no concept of financial asset. It simply goes with investments, loans, or maybe it says current assets and non-current assets. Under that, you show investments, loans, other 
uh, non-current asset. Here, whatever assets which are covered by means of India's 109 financial statements should be given based on the date of their expected realization. Uh, if it is a non-current in classification, I will come to that non-current classification a little later. That's the reason why I don't want to use the exact definition now. So for the time being, you assume that if it is a non-current asset and covered by India's 109 financial instrument, within that, what is the subcategory? Investments, loans, other financial assets has to be given by the company. And then again comes other non-current asset, which is uh, not uh, falling into any of the previous category. Then the subtotal. With respect to current assets, you might have seen that inventory comes under current assets. Again, financial asset, which is considered as current in nature, is also comes under this particular category. So again, here investments, trade receivable, cash and cash equivalents, and bank balances other than the above. The trade receivable can be both current as well as non-current. Investments can be both current or non-current. We will see that little later when we are uh, looking into the decision tree relating to current asset. Cash and cash equivalent as defined by India 7 will be presented here. Any bank balances which are not considered as cash and cash equivalent and are considered as current in nature should be presented as a separate line item bank balances other than above. So normally what will come here? If you have cash and cash equivalent, under that you have cash balance, you have balances in current account or deposit accounts which are having original maturity of three months. Meaning I have deposited in June, expected to uh, mature within three months from June then that item is considered as cash and cash equivalent. Suppose I have put a fixed deposit, no encumbrance, no lien marked, but that will not have original maturity of three months. It will be maturing after three months, but before 12 months from the end of the previous year or the end of the financial year, it will be considered as bank balances other than above and cannot be included under cash and cash equivalent. So in simple terms, fixed deposit having original maturity of three months can be cash and cash equivalent. All other bank deposits will be bank balances other than above if it is maturing within 12 months from the end of the uh, accounting period or if it is going to be realized after 12 months, it will go to other bank balances under non-current asset. Okay, This is to understand this classification. Like that loan can also be current portion, non-current portion. We will see what is that. The residual category is other, non, other current assets. So the subtotal has also been seen. The total of non-current asset and current assets is what we are seeing as the total for the asset side of the balance sheet. Now we go to the equity and liability side of the balance sheet. Equity is nothing but the shareholders funds whatever is the funds contributed by the shareholder and whatever is attributable to the shareholders at the time when the company goes for liquidation, those items are considered as part of equity. Now, why I am showing equity share capital separately and other equities separately? For the time being, we will not get into a, a worry on preference shares just have it in your mind preference shares are considered as financial liability and not share capital under india's as per india's 109 when i am taking a session on india's 109 financial instruments i will discuss the other classification of uh, preference shares like redeemable preference shares convertible preference shares cumulative preference shares etc we'll discuss that later what do you mean by other equity you remember that one of the component of the financial statement under India, as we said, it's a statement of changes in equity. The statement of changes in equity is nothing but a 
combined statement of share capital and all the reserves and surplus attributable to the shareholders. For example, if I have the balance in profit and loss count, it will go to other equity. If I have other comprehensive income, a new concept which I am using, I will explain that during the course of uh, this explanation for statement of profit and loss count. Other comprehensive income, balance if any, that will be shown as part of the uh, other equity. There could be compound financial instrument like convertible preference shares or convertible debentures. There is an equity portion is also available according to India's 32. Then that equity portion will be part of the other equity. So except equity share capital, all other items will be forming part of other equity. And the sum total of this equity share capital and other equity will normally flow from statement of changes in equity, which is a new component under NDS. Now, we have seen that the share capital and, uh, or I should use the word equity, share capital and the other equity put together is the equity. And then Liability side, as we have seen in asset side, here also liabilities are classified into non-current liabilities and current liabilities. Again, within non-current liabilities, if it is financial liability that is shown separately, all other items are shown separately. So similarly, here if you see financial liabilities are both non-current also is there, some of them, and there are some items which are current also. For example, long-term long borrowings is a financial liability and it is shown under non-current. Whereas trade payable is a current liability and accordingly it is shown here. Suppose if you have short-term borrowings or uh, working capital limits which you have taken, those items will also come under current liabilities, financial liabilities, short-term borrowings. Similarly, provisions can be long-term provision, then it will be shown under non-current liabilities. It can be short term provision which will be shown under current liabilities. So this again subtotals of the current liability and non-current liability is being made and total liability is also given as a subtotal. So equity and total liabilities put together is your balance sheet asset side, uh, sorry liability side. So having seen the balance sheet. So what are all the new things which we have learned? The first time preparer of the financial statement normally gives three balance sheet. One is for the current period, another is for the comparative period and third on the date of transition. What is the date of transition? Is the date on which the opening India's balance sheet has been prepared. We will cover that as part of India's 101 first time adoption of India's a critical standard which I will cover with actual conversion of an IGAP financial statement into an India's financial statement for the benefit of the audience. In fact, when I started, I thought that this session will be for the benefit of students, but the feedback which I have received from majority of my fellow professionals is that they are also finding it useful and the uh, reach is also uh, encouraging that a lot of feedback has happened and based on the feedback only, I am sharing a lot of inputs like showing the actual uh, Excel file, etc. for the benefit of you to have an understanding rather than, rather than just talking theoretically on the aspects. And this, the second thing which we have seen in the balance sheet is it comes, asset comes first and the equity and liability comes next. Equity we are going to show as equity share capital and other equity and there is something called financial instruments which we have seen which can be financial liability or financial asset. So with that overall understanding of balance sheet I think you might have understood how it is structured how it is flowing into the balance sheet as per India's. Let's uh, move on because we have talked about current assets and non-current asset. We have talked about current liability and non-current liability. What does it mean? We have to understand.
then only it is possible for us to present it properly, right? So, I was looking into index one zero in index one, which was actually giving me how I have to do the entire presentation. Now, the question which I was having is that whether this format which we are discussing is available under IFRS also? As I have said already, no specified format has been given by IAS 1. Only IAS 1 is also not giving any format. Since we are covered by Companies Act, so we are using Schedule 3. Okay. So if you are preparing under IFRS, the way in which you are presenting current and non-current asset equity liability will be similar. But the only thing is, there is no exact format which has been prescribed. Now, how I can identify a particular asset as a current asset or a non-current asset is an important consideration. In this one gives certain conditions. I should say there are four conditions which has been given. If any one of the condition has been satisfied, the asset is considered as a current asset. If none of the conditions have been satisfied, it becomes a non-current asset. When you are looking into the standard, the standard gives us a narrative. But I understand, based on my experience when I was teaching in days to professionals as well as speaking in a lot of forums, where the audience wanted to understand by means of a flow chart. So that's the reason why I have mentioned that it's a current asset decision tree. If you are using your knowledge of search in the index one, you will not find any decision tree. So this is for my easy presentation. I have used the decision tree concept. Hopefully, it will be useful for you to understand it easily. The first rule or first question which I am going to ask is that, is this particular item of an asset is expected to be realized, sold or consumed within the normal operating cycle? What is the normal operating cycle is nothing but company has cash, it purchases raw material or traded goods. It converts that into WIP. The traded goods or finished goods are sold and trade receivables comes into the balance sheet and trade receivable is subsequently collected after the credit period into cash. So the cash to cash cycle is what we call it as an operating cycle. So India is first asked the question whether a particular asset is expected to be realized, sold or consumed within the normal operating cycle. What is expected to be realized? Maybe I have a trade receivable. Whether the trade receivable will, is expected to be realized within the operating cycle. For example, my operating cycle is within three months cash to cash will happen. Whether I am going to realize it within three months. So if I am saying the answer yes, then we will have the answer that it's a current asset. What is sold? I have traded goods or finished goods which I am selling and if it is expected to be sold in the normal operating cycle, it's a current asset. So inventory is a current asset or it is consumed within the normal operating cycle. For example, I have raw material, consumable tools, etc. Those items are consumed during the operating cycle, then those items are also considered as a current asset. That's the reason why when we are considering inventory, inventory is always fall into the category of a current asset because it's normally consumed within the normal operating cycle. Suppose if you answer, no, this particular item is neither covered by operating cycle. For example, investment is not covered within the operating cycle. Or if I'm saying that, the item is covered by operating cycle, but not expected to be realized within the operating cycle. Within three months or six months, it is not expected to be realized. So what I have to do? The next rule says, is it held for sale? Are you holding this particular asset for the purposes of selling? If you say, yes, it's held for sale, 
then that item again will be a current asset. For example, if I am considering that <coughs> inventory is always held for sale, even if the inventory is not expected to be sold within the normal operating cycle, within three months, but it is always held for sale and accordingly inventory can never be part of a non-current asset. Similarly, I have some investment which I am held for sale, not held for using it for maybe till the maturity date I am not going to use it. It's regularly I am buying and selling this particular investment. It's held for sale, then it is always a current asset. Even though it is a financial asset, it will fall into the current asset classification. So under financial as assets, I will show, sorry, under current assets, under financial asset, this investments will be shown as a current asset. Suppose if I am saying, sorry, neither of these two rules is applicable for this particular asset, then I will ask the next question. Whether this particular asset is expected to be realized within 12 months from the end of the reporting period. End of the reporting period is, say for example, 31st March 2019. Whether it is expected to be realized within 31st March 2020, then that particular asset is considered to be a current asset. If I am saying no, this is also not applicable to me. A specific question or specific rule is relating to cash and cash equivalent. If it is an unrestricted cash and cash equivalent, what you are showing in the balance sheet without any restriction, you can collect that money back within a normal period. It is always considered as a current asset. So even though it's cash and cash equivalent, there is a conflict between this standard and the format of India's one. Uh, cash and cash equivalent is as defined by AS, India S7, AS3, whereas other cash balances can be current asset. That's the reason why if you recollect when I show the balance sheet, I have shown bank balances other than the above under current asset classification. So we should see whether it's unrestricted cash and cash equivalent or if it is not, I have to apply the second theory whether it is expected to be realized within the next 12 months. So that comes as a current asset. In case none of this condition is satisfied by a particular asset, then the asset is considered as a non-current asset. Now, the point is if you have this flowchart handy, any item which you wanted to understand whether it has to be classified into current or non-current. You can simply understand by means of going through the flowchart and you will have the perfect answer where it should be presented as current or non-current. Similar thing, I have converted the four rules which has been given for current liabilities or non-current liabilities determination by means of a decision tree. More or less the rules are similar to what we have seen in current asset decision tree. A slight modification, there we are talking about realization, here we will call it about settlement. And there are some additional concepts because cash and cash equivalent cannot be part of current liability. So to that extent, there is a different question which is coming in. So let us understand this decision tree. Why I am trying to connect with the decision tree of the current assets is for a simple reason. Whenever we recap what we are trying to learn new with what we have already learned, there is a possibility of this goes into our mind very strongly and the, uh, the, the reserve capability or retaining capability is much, much higher. So that's the reason why I'm trying to say that. So even if you have forgotten, what is the decision tree for current liability? You can come from current asset. Similarly, you can come from current liability decision tree to current assets decision tree. That's the reason why I'm trying to connect. So the first question is whether this particular liability is expected to be settled within the normal operating cycle. Liability cannot be sold. Liability cannot be consumed. 
That's the reason why it is using only expected to be settled within the normal operating cycle compared to current asset decision tree. If I say yes, it is expected to be settled within the normal operating cycle, it is a current liability. Suppose if yes, I say no, it is not expected to realize within the normal operating cycle. What I have supposed to do? Go to the next rule. The next rule asks, is it held for sale? The normal question which comes to our mind is how a liability can be held for sale? Asset can be held for sale, but how a liability can be held for sale? Could be a question which comes to our mind. Please understand there is a specific standard called IND AS 105, which is talking about non-current non asset held for sale and disposal units. What does it mean? Suppose if a company wanted to dispose a particular operation, particular uh, vertical of its business cycle or business model, assuming that they have four or five different uh, business verticals. One is trading, one is uh, manufacturing, one is maybe manufacturing of uh, textile items, one is uh, manufacturing of uh, industrial items, if, if you consider as an example. And they have decided to dispose of the textile unit. The asset is also held for sale and whatever liability relating to that is also held for sale. If somebody is trying to buy that particular asset, what we will say as a total unit you buy along with the assets and liabilities. So there could be a possibility that the liability may be held for sale and that is a current liability. And the, if I am not fulfilling any one of these two conditions. The third condition which I normally look for is whether it is due to be settled within 12 months from the end of the reporting period. Now, let's stop for a moment. There we have settled whether expected to be realized. Here I am using the word due to be settled. There is a difference between these two which you Keep it on back of your mind. I will explain it a little later. The other point which we have to consider is whether due to be settled within 12 months from the end of the reporting period, there is a possibility that a portion of a non-current liability can be due to be settled within the next 12 months and accordingly they should be shown under current liability. A classical example is repayment of term loans which are due for the next 12 months. That portion will not be shown under non-current liability. It will be shown under current liability. For better understanding, people used to present the total non-current liability including the current portion. Then less uh, current maturities of long-term borrowings shown under current liabilities refer the cross reference of the particular note on current liability. So any portion of a liability which can be totally due to be settled within 12 months or even a portion of the non-current liability could also be due to be settled within the next 12 months from the end of the reporting period. That portion should be shown as current liability. The fourth classification or fourth rule for classification says whether the company has an unconditional right to defer settlement of the liability for at least 12 months after the reporting date. So what does it mean? Suppose a company has borrowed a term loan. I, I put an example. Took a term loan and the company has a holiday period of one year for repayment of principal. So to that extent, the company has an unconditional right to defer settlement of that loan beyond 12 months from the end of the reporting period. Okay. So if there is an unconditional right to defer settlement, it is a long term in nature or non-current in nature. Suppose if the company does not have the right to or unconditional does not have the unconditional right to defer the settlement beyond 12 months, it should be treated as a current liability. Term loan I have said. With the moratorium period, there is a possibility that it will be only non-current liability or it may be combining both current portion as well as non-current portion. 
non current portion i have an unconditional right to defer settlement so accordingly it becomes a non current let us take another example i have taken cash credit limit or working capital limit which are renewed year on year i have taken a loan from the bank and the bank is always renewing my loan every time it is renewing it is actually an upward revision because my performance is also going up so that's what i am trying to uh, my my working capital limits is operates in that manner if the working capital limits is being renewed year on year can i treat that as a non current liability because in my balance sheet it sits as it is or it go, goes on increasing rather than decreasing can i show that as a non current liability if you see the last condition or last rule for determining whether this liability is a current liability or not it is ask you to check one asset test whether the entity does not have an unconditional right to defer settlement in a cash credit account it's always repayable on demand and the bank can renew or it can repay it can ask for repayment of that particular item uh, on demand so accordingly even though it is liable to be renewed year on year and permanently stays in the balance sheet since it is not fulfilling the fourth condition working capital limits are normally considered as non as as a current liability and it cannot go into non current liability classification now the question comes suppose if a company borrowed loans which is long term in nature but because of default the bank has <coughs> sent a notice recalling that loan what happens if the notice has been received before the year end even though it is a term loan the last condition will not be satisfied as at the reporting period that means even though originally there was a repayment schedule which has been given now the bank has recalled that loan when it is a recalled that loan the company does not have an unconditional right to defer settlement beyond 12 months from the end of the reporting period so accordingly any recalled loans should be always classified as current liability normally this happens when the uh, bank has issued a notice because of npa and that notice has been received by the uh, client and sometimes when surface notice has been issued in all those cases you have to be very very careful so especially where there is a default in repayment of loan you have to specifically ask the client whether any notice of recall has been issued if notice of recall is not issued there is a carve out which we have done under i gap sorry under indas we will continue to show that as non current liability only i for us says the moment the loan covenants are not met automatically it becomes a current liability so there is a carve out which is available so what we have to look into is there any issue relating to recall notice has been issued by the bank if it is issued then it has to be reclassified to current liability when i am reclassifying to current liability in the current year whether the previous years balance should also be reclassified to current liability my view is no because the position or the determination of a current asset or current liability has been determined based on the facts and circumstances existing as on that balance sheet date so last year i don't have a default last year i have an unconditional right right to defer settlement beyond 12 months so to that extent it is a non current liability in last year just because it becomes a current liability in the current year that doesn't mean that i have to restate the previous year balance also accordingly because uh, there is uh, a separate standard india is 8 which is talking about uh, uh, how you have to account for uh the change in accounting policy or change in accounting estimate or prior period errors it says only if there is an error in the previous year restatement is required if it, there is no uh, error it is only based on the current year circumstances it becomes a current liability i will not restate the previous years balance this applies equally for current assets and non current asset classification as well as i said please keep something on the back of your mind 
there is a difference between due to be settled and expected to be settled. If you recollect the current asset decision tree was using the word expected to be realized and it is not saying that due to be realized. It says expected to be realized. That means when the management expects that it should be realized, whether it is expected to be realized within 12 months according to the management assessment, still it becomes a current asset. When it comes to current liability, it is using the word due to be settled and not expected to be settled. That means I have a creditor where the credit terms are say for example 90 days, but for some dispute I am not making the payment. I am not expecting to settle it for the next one year. Whether that particular trade payable will be a non-current liability? The answer is no because the emphasis is on a due to be settled and accordingly it is already due to be settled. I am holding the payment that's all. That doesn't change the category or characteristics of the asset from current to non-current liability. Okay. This is an important thing which we have to keep it in our mind. Some quick points, uh, maybe these questions may be in your mind and it is not an interactive session. So I'm asking the question and I'm answering this question as well. One of the point which we have to have is that whenever an asset has to be classified into current or non-current, you should understand the client's business. For example, a land held by a real estate developer will be a current asset because it's held for sale as an inventory or development in the operating cycle into a finished product and then sold as a flat. Whereas the land in respect of a manufacturing unit will be part of non-current because it's a property plant and equipment. So you have to be careful, understand what is the client's business based on which the asset or liability requires a classification. The second important aspect is that we said the asset classification is normally based on the intention of the management. Management has the intention to settle it, sorry, realize it only after, it expects that it will be realized only after 12 months from the end of the reporting period. And because of that, it becomes a non-current asset. But at the same time, if management says that, no, 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 I will collect this within the next 12 months. So accordingly, I wanted to put it in current asset classification. Whatever management says is what we are testing, what we are agreeing, because the it is not auditor's uh, prerogative to decide whether it's a current asset or non-current asset, but the auditor has to necessarily ask the management to demonstrate how you are believing that you are expected to realize it within next 12 months from the end of the reporting period. It's a very important aspect. Management can give whatever reasoning, but it should be demonstrated. Auditor should follow our auditor should test that. As I have said, expected to realize is from the point of view of the management. Okay. And when what is the difference between this uh, first uh, or second one and third one? Maybe one more thing which I can add. If I have a land that I am showing as part of property plan equipment, but there is a surplus land in the factory. That surplus land, what I am going to do, I have not yet decided. There is a separate standard called India S40, investment property. It says if the future use of an asset is not determined, then it should be considered as a investment property if it is in the nature of land and buildings or both. Okay. So accordingly, the intention of the management when they are saying, no, no, we are you are going to use it for the purposes of our future expansion of factory, it can continue to be in property plan equipment, but they have to demonstrate that, yes, this surplus land will also be used only for the business. So that is one shuttle difference between second and third bullet. Third bullet is normally we come across this situation. Trade payables, uh, sorry, trade receivables outstanding for more than three years, but management always says that we will collect it in the next three months so that no provision is required. So whether I have to consider that as current asset or non-current asset, as per the management intention expected to be realized is next to 12 months, so it becomes current asset. But the facts of the case, last three years it is not collected. What is the new evidence which will be 
available to ensure that I will be able to collect it within the next three months is an important aspect. Okay, so it should be demonstrated in the, both the cases. So audit procedure should necessarily be applied by the auditor to ensure that their whatever management represents is having a sufficient appropriate corroborative audit evidence to conclude that the management judgment or management uh, conclusion is acceptable to the audit auditors as well some more additional checkpoints as this i have said last year it is non current asset in the current year it's a current asset whether i have to restate the previous year as i have already uh, explained unless there was an error in the last year where that asset should have been classified as current asset but unfortunately um, by mistake it has been classified as non current asset then the restatement comes into the picture when that type of error has been corrected by means of restatement there is an issue which we call as a uh, correction of prior period errors in as 8 comes into the picture and uh, we talk about a third balance sheet in that case as well so i will explain that concept a little later a company always says this is held for sale how long i have to wait to accept the statement yes this asset is held for sale and accordingly it is still continue to be a current asset if you see held for sale again should be expected to happen in the immediate near future when i am using the word immediate near future it is expected to be sold within the next 12 months so if it is not demonstrated then held for sale category may not be applied by the company so we have to be cautious on this to determine a particular item as a current as a category or a non current category loan covenant we have discussed already in india only if there is a recall notice issued then we will reclassify the term liability into non current uh, current liability otherwise we will continue to show that as a non current liability another interesting question comes because uh, indias requires a preparation of consolidated financial statement and companies act also requires consolidated uh, financial statement to be prepared and presented uh, one of the question which comes is assuming that i have classified a particular item as property plan equipment in the stand alone financial statement whether the same thing can continue to be in the consolidated financial statement also in the same category the concept it may be or may not be depending upon the circumstance of the case i think i have some examples to discuss this particular point so we will uh, move on to the next slide so uh, it is always easy to understand by means of case studies the concept and that is the reason why i am putting some four or five case studies for you to understand and all these items as i have already said you can put any item of an asset or a liability into the flow chart and you will get an answer whether it should be a current asset or non current asset or current liability or a non current liability let me take is it a current asset i i take some questions the operating cycle is 15 months assuming that it's a long term gestation period industry so it is 15 months because it's it's uh, manufacturing aircrafts maybe company like hcl or any other company which is manufacturing aircrafts the accounts receivable is expected to realize within 15 months whether the accounts receivable or trade receivable is considered as current asset is the question so what is the four rules if we trying to recollect the first condition says whether expected to be realized consumed sold within the normal operating cycle whether this particular item satisfies that normal operating cycle is 15 months trade receivable is also expected to realize within 15 months the moment the first condition or first rule is satisfied because we said even one condition has been satisfied it becomes a current asset so it automatically becomes a current asset let us take another example 
the average operating cycle of the company, again we are talking about a company which is manufacturing aircraft, is 18 months. It has some investments and these investments can be sold at any time. It's not held for sale. It can be sold at any time. It's available for sale and uh, management believes that they will sell it only within the next 15 months, not within 12 months, within the next 15 months. Now we put this into our rule. What it says, whether the asset is expected to be realized, sold, consumed within the operating cycle. Operating cycle is 18 months, expected to be realized within 15 months. Seems to be yes, it is expected to be realized. But please understand, whether investment covered by means of the operating cycle? Definitely no. And accordingly, the first condition cannot be applied for an investment. So next question is whether it's held for sale. It is not held for sale because it only says at any point of time it can be sold, available for sale. So second condition is not satisfied. What is the third condition? Whether it's expected to be realized within the next 12 months? No, it is expected to be realized within only after 12 months, within 15 months. Third condition also failed. What is the fourth condition? Whether it is unrestricted cash or cash equivalent. Investment is not cash and cash equivalent. So naturally, all the four conditions are not satisfied by this. So to that extent, an investment which is expected to be realized within the next 15 months should be treated as a non-current asset. Okay. It is not operating cycle because operating cycle is not applicable for a financial asset. Can we take some more example? Okay. Company has excess finished goods, but it's not expecting to sell that within the next 18 months because of what is capable of being sold is already there. There's an excess inventory which is available. Operating cycle is 18 months whether this inventory has to be treated as a non-current inventory because operating cycle is not fulfilled. 12 months is also not fulfilled. Cash and cash equivalent is also not fulfilled. But what we have to see is that what is the condition? First, I go to the flow chart. Whether expected to be realized within the operating cycle? No, failed. Second condition is held for sale. Always inventory is held for sale. So naturally, Inventory will never will be classified as non-current item, even if they are held for a longer duration. But as an auditor, you will be very, very clear about the audit procedure, whether it creates some sort of impairment on the carrying value of the inventory. When we are talking about impairment for inventory, it is nothing but whether there is a non uh, realizable net realizable value will fall down be, below the cost of the inventory. Then we have to write down the inventory to the extent of the net realizable value. So that's the audit consideration which we have to talk about. Otherwise, inventory will always be a current asset. So there is a contract which the company has entered into. I am taking another example. The company has entered into a contract which has a credit period of three months. Operating cycle is six months, but company does not expect it to realize the payment with respect to that particular trade receivable within the next 12 months. So what happens? We put that again into our flowchart, easiest way of uh, understanding the current and non-current classification. Whether it is expected to be realized within the operating cycle, no, six months is the operating cycle. I'm expecting to realize after 12 months, so not applicable. Whether it is held for sale, Datas are not held for sale or trade receivable is not held for sale. So second condition is not uh, fulfilled. Third condition, whether expected to be realized within 12 months from the end of the reporting period, not satisfied because here they are saying it is not expected. And the fourth condition is, is the trade receivable is unrestricted cash and cash equivalent? The answer is no. And accordingly, a trade receivable, which is not expected to be realized within the next 12 months, from the end of the reporting period or if the operating cycle is beyond 12 months within the operating cycle should be classified as non-current asset.
So a trade receivable can become a non-current asset. Auditor and the management has to be careful on this particular classification. Now, some more examples. To understand not necessarily on current and non-current classification, I think that I have already discussed about this. A real estate development company is having land and they are building with the intention of building the residential flats and will be sold upon completion, whether the land has to be classified as current. So for a real estate development, based on the business of the company, it is nothing but inventory. So it will continue to be classified as current asset. Suppose if the uh, land is held without any future, un, uh, the, uh, without any determination with respect to the future use. It goes to investment property standard in days 40. In days 40, the moment it has been classified as investment property comes as a non-current item. So you should understand what is the intention. Here only the question is, what is the intention of the management is important, but it should be demonstrated. That's what we have discussed. Suppose this is a peculiar scenario because all practical issues can come even in a normal business environment. In this, what we are trying to find out is that a real estate developer develops a property and he was treating that as part of his inventory. But he may retain certain portions and give it on rent. Because he wanted to hold it for some period, the market may not be good, but he wanted to hold it for some period and then he wanted to sell it. Because it is realizing rent, whether it should be reclassified to investment property as per India S40, again the intention is to hold it for a certain period, maybe for getting a good price and only during the period temporarily it has been given on rent. So it never loses the characteristics of inventory. So that is the reason why it has to be very, very important. Uh, what is their intention? What they are wanting to do? Whether they will continue to hold it for rent, realize, uh, recovering rent only, or they will be selling it in the future. If the intention is to sell, it's only a temporary period for which it has been held as investment property, then you need not reclassify it into non-current uh, classification. So this is the intention of the management which has been explained to us. But as we have very, very clearly understood, the intention of the management should be always demonstrated and our audit procedure should document how we have verified the intention of the management. I, have, I was talking about the parent company and subsidiary company, right? So what will happen? in the standalone financial statement as well as in the consolidated financial statement. Let's take an example. A parent company owns certain office complex out of which one portion of that has been given to its subsidiaries. So for example, they have 10 flows, three flows they have retained and seven flows they have given to various subsidiaries which they are holding. The seven subsidiary, seven flows which we are talking about will be considered as part of investment property. So when the parent prepares its standalone financial statement, whatever has been leased out to the subsidiary is nothing but held for the purposes of capital appreciation or for uh, letting it on rent to others, which is the definition of investment property. It meets the criteria. So automatically, you have to classify that as part of investment property in the standalone financial statement. When we prepare the consolidated financial statement for the group, parent standalone financial statement and the subsidiary standalone financial statement when they are combined, what we are seeing is that it's a group's financial statement. As far as the group is concerned, whatever premises which has been taken on rent by the subsidiary, and what has been given on rent by the parent is still used for the business purposes of the group. And accordingly, it becomes a property plant and equipment from investment property category. So you have to always see 
what could be the situation where indented use changes as well as whether it is a parent and subsidiary companies and standalone and consolidation come to, into the picture. So I think that we have understood reasonably well <coughs> the classification of current and non-current and also based on the intention it has to be taken into consideration. I think we have covered reasonably well how a balance sheet has to be prepared, presented between current and non-current, what are all the requirement for current and non-current. There are four conditions. Even if one condition has been satisfied, it becomes a current asset. Management uh, perspective has to be always considered for classification. Management intention should always be considered for classification, but it should be demonstrated. We have seen all these things. And for current liability, again, four conditions we have seen. And we have seen expected to be realized is different from due to be settled and accordingly even if the management is not going to repay the loan because of some dispute if it is already due it has to be taken into consideration let's move on to statement of profit and loss nothing but profit and loss count commonly we use so let us understand this here there is something new concept which is coming in. It says a statement of profit and loss count should be presented as a single statement approach. What do you mean by single statement approach? IFRS gives two statement approach as well as single statement approach. Nothing but a single statement approach with two sections that is comprehensive income statement other comprehensive income statement. If they are combined together and shown under a single statement, that is called a single statement approach. Uh, I will show the profit and loss count a little later so that you can understand this. Under India's, a single statement approach with two sections has been permitted and two statement approach is not permitted. IFRS allows you to have statement of comprehensive income for the year ended as a separate statement statement of other comprehensive income for the year ended as a separate statement that called two statement approach for India it is a single statement approach. This I have discussed uh, in the last session also. We cannot give based on functional classification of an item in the profit and loss count. So we, we cannot say uh, cost of goods sold, administrative overheads, selling overheads, we cannot have it like that because if I am using the word administrative overhead, it includes even depreciation for the assets used for the administrative purposes. So it says it should go be only by nature of expenses model. And that classification says nothing but you have to show based on the nature of the expenditure. For example, cost of materials consumed, changes in inventories, your employee cost, depreciation and amortization, the finance cost, all these items are nature of expenses. You have to present the financial statement only based on nature of expenses classification. Again, India's one is not prescribing the format of the financial statement. Schedule 3 to the Companies Act prescribes the format. For India's companies, it's a division 2 of Schedule 3. Before we go into the next one, let us have a quick look of how the PNL has been presented by an India's company and a single statement approach. You may see here that it is for the year ended and it is for the same company for which we have shown a balance sheet where we have shown three year period, current period, comparative period and date of transition. But here only two periods has been given that is for the current period and for the comparative period. Income from continuing operations has to be given separately and the net result of discontinuing operation has to be given separately. 
and for your understanding there is no difference between the existing schedule 6 which has been revised under 1956 act and schedule 3 so the format remains the same and the expenses which has to be shown uh, what i have talked about cost of material consumed etc and profit before exceptional items and tax interestingly there is something which comes into our consideration exceptional items we are not using extraordinary items because under indas 1 as well as under ifrs there is no item is called extraordinary item under ifrs there is no concept of exceptional item ifrs only says if an entity believes that it will make a relevant and reliable presentation it can add any line item separately on the face of the pnl account that means assuming that in a hospital where the major outflow is the consultant fee the hospital can decide to include one line item saying that fees paid to doctors and consultants as one of the line item even though that item is not here in this uh, financial statement this is the format which has been have we normally talk about all the items will go to other expenses but for a hospital they wanted to know what is the total outflow arising out of the uh, payment made to the consultants and doctors who have performed the various surgeries and procedures for their inpatients and outpatients so it is possible for the company to include it you can add a new line item and show that as a separate line item so showing that separately as a on the face of the pnl is based on relevant presentation which you wanted to make use of it for giving a proper understanding of the entire expenditure to the user of the financial statement indias 1 also permits that but indias 1 is not talking about exceptional item but schedule 3 talks about exceptional item and because of that if any company believes that these items i wanted to put it as an exceptional item the auditor cannot object and if it fulfills the definition of exceptional items as per schedule 3 that item can be part of the exceptional item for example in this case also the company has put some items of loss as an exceptional item in the previous year around 680.36 lakhs they have shown as an exceptional item maybe they might have treated that this is arising out of if i uh, uh, understand or maybe i am trying to understand this could be suppose if the company has sold a property plan equipment a land has been sold and they have made profit they don't want it to show as part of the operating profits they wanted to show that as an exceptional item or they have incurred losses <coughs> with respect to sale of a property they don't want it to show that as part of their operating income so or operating uh, profits so they are trying to show that as part of exceptional item and in case if the company is having some discontinuing operations then the discontinuing operations will be shown after this uh, after what is the profit from operating activities then you will show what is the profit from discontinuing operations as a single line item profit or loss that's a net result you will show and what is the tax impact you will show as a separate line item in this case it is not there so up to this profit or loss for the year is nothing but what we call as a comprehensive income statement the other section other comprehensive income is normally an unrealized gains and losses we will see what is other comprehensive income little later so those items other comprehensive income statement will be shown as a separate section and both put together is what we call it as a total comprehensive income for the year this is what we call it as a single statement approach having two sections comprehensive income and other comprehensive income all other items are similar to what we have seen uh, in our existing practice so hope uh, you have understood what is the structure of the statement of profit and loss as i have said say whatever is the 
regular incomes and expenditure which is arising from the normal course will be comprehensive income what is uh, not recognized in the profit and loss count and which has been permitted this is very important which has been permitted by a particular indas unless an indas permits this item to be classified as an other comprehensive income you cannot have all types of other uh, unrealized gains into oci or other comprehensive income for example if a company wanted to fair value its uh, investments there is two possible classification under financial instrument standard one says fair value through pnl another says fair value through oca if you are using the concept of fair value through oca india is 109 allows you to take it to oca if you are going to treat that as fair value through pnl it should be treated as part of the comprehensive income so it cannot be other comprehensive income so a standard has to specifically allow you to present that as a comprehensive other comprehensive income otherwise nothing can go into oci that is a very important rule which we have to consider comprehensive income plus other comprehensive income is total comprehensive income for the period so as i have mentioned there is an ex explicit prohibition of treating any item of income or expenditure as an extraordinary item but exceptional is permitted because of schedule 3 what do you mean by other comprehensive income all these items are considered as other comprehensive income basically these items are covered by respective standard for example if i am talking about property plan equipment as per india 16 when you are doing a revaluation and every time the revaluation has been done the revaluation changes has to be gain or losses arising out of the revaluation should be routed through oca and not through pnl account and cash flow hedges comes from india 109 and uh, uh, when you are translating your foreign subsidiaries which are independent foreign operation you have foreign currency translation reserve fctr that will be part of oca and when you are having a certain financial asset which has been classified as fair value through oca any changes in the measurement will also come to oca actual gains and losses relating to employee benefits actually it uses the word defined benefit plan when you are using defined benefit plan normally gratuity is one of the classical example when you have the actual valuation of the gratuity one of the component which they will mention is what is the actual gains and losses what is the impact because of change in the actual assumptions compared to the previous year due to the actualization or because the assumption becomes true in the current period that will be considered as an actual gain or loss as the case may be that item should also be part of other comprehensive income as i have said already unless an accounting standard specifically prescribes no item can be classified into oci by the management so management doesn't have any discretion i don't wanted to put that as part of uh, oci comprehensive income i will show that as part of uh, oci because people are normally considering eps uh, before oci so it will be helpful for me it is not possible for the company to do that <laughs> let's move on to the important component which is a new element statement of changes in equity as i have mentioned it is nothing but what is the opening component opening balance of each component of the equity and it may be profit and loss count oci items which are directly recognized in equity uh, certain transactions which are specifically coming into that all those items are considered and what is the closing balance so you have to show the opening to closing balance the movement has to be captured by in a columnar basis so it is more or less gives it reconciliation between opening and closing equity for you to understand i am trying to show the format of the statement of changes in equity which is basically goes like this i am learning a lot when i am trying to record this for example initially i thought that i will show this as a excel file but i have seen that my picture or whatever i am doing this comes as a overlay on the file so to that extent you are not able to see so i am including some more additional line items so that i can move the cursor on to understand so here 
the name states that this is for the year ended. It is not as at the year ended because it shows the moment during the period. That is the reason why it is for the year ended. And it has two categories. One, equity share capital. If you remember that in the balance sheet, we have seen equity share capital and B, other equity. So A and B put together will go to the balance sheet. A will go to equity share capital total and other equity, the sum total of all the components will go to the other equity portion in the balance sheet. So again, equity share capital, you have to show the movement from the date of transition to the comparative period to the reporting period. Okay, date of transition for the time being, don't get confused. You just keep it in your mind that this is nothing but the opening date of the comparative period. And there is a uh, importance attached to this. And we will see what is that importance when we are going forward in the series. And for each component of other equity, you have to show what is the component and what is the opening balance, what is the movement during the period and what is the uh, total and subtotal or grand total of all these items put together will go into your balance sheet as part of your other equity. So uh, it's nothing but as I have mentioned, combination of your share capital plus reserves and surplus, but put in a columnar format showing the movement from opening to closing. Okay. This is your new statement of changes in equity. And as far as the notes on accounts is concerned, there are some guidance which has been given in India S1. What it says is that you should always show what is the basis of preparation of your financial statement, whether it is done on the basis of going concern or otherwise, and what are all the significant accounting policy. You remember that I have mentioned if the second one explicit and unreserved statement of compliance with the index is not there, this is not considered as an index financial statement. So there should be a specific paragraph where the company should mention that in the preparation of the financial statement, all the applicable NDAs as notified by companies accounting standard rules 2015 as amended from time to time, depending upon what is the way in which you wanted to mention or some people are simply mentioning uh, the Indian accounting standards as notified under section 133 of the Companies Act 2013. It's, it's okay as long as you are consistently making that presentation, but this explicit and unreserved statement of compliance should be part of the notes and accounts. Otherwise, it, even if you are prepared with all compliance, it is not considered as an NDIS financial statement. Interestingly, IGAP never wants you to talk about what is your management judgment. It is expecting that the user of the financial statement should understand that maybe management might have taken a judgment here. For example, I'm making a provision for doubtful debts. I'm making a provision for warranty. What is the judgment I have done? When I'm expecting a, a trade receivable considered to be doubtful, I make my judgment as a management, but I never disclose those items because it's not mandatory under IGAP. But here it is mandatory what are all the judgments which the management has taken in applying a particular accounting policy? For example, even uh, a critical judgment could be recognizing a deferred tax asset. How the management believes there will be taxable, uh, sorry, uh, reversible temporary differences at the future period. So that is a management judgment. And the management believes that I wanted to treat this particular item as part of investment property, what is the management judgment? Why they have considered that? So all those things are forming part of this. What is the key assumptions which the management has taken? For example, management provides for doubtful debts on the assumption that only if the debts are outstanding for more than six months or one year, that is considered as part of my doubtful debts. In days 109 talks about expected credit loss, but still the key assumptions of how they have asked to do this should be specifically mentioned. And from which source, what is the source? Maybe from past trend or maybe based on what is the economy in which they are operating or the industry in which they are operating could be a key assumption and the source can brought in that should part of the notes and accounts. 
Suppose a particular index requires a specific disclosure to be added according to index, that disclosure should also be part of the uh, notes and accounts. In simple terms, what is required as per Schedule 3 alone is not the disclosure. All other things which has been given in index 1 and plus other standards should be part of it. Sometimes there are some disclosure required by means of statute. For example, we make a disclosure relating to dues to uh, MSME sector and that is a legal requirement. That should also be part of the disclosure. So all those things has to come. Let me quickly take you through uh, one Excel file where I can show you how the structure is actually happening <coughs> with respect to the notes and accounts so that you can understand what happens. One thing which is encouraged is to include what is the corporate information, what is the company, what is its uh, parent company, what is its ultimate parent company, what type of industry in which the company is uh, engaged. Uh, it will give a good guidance for or good insight to the reader of the financial statement to understand the industry in which the company is operating. As I have said, basis of preparation should specifically talk about statement of compliance with uh, the financial statement. And there is an error here. It talks about international financial reporting standard because this specimen format I have used for making a presentation to IFRS. Here it should be in accordance with Indian accounting standard. Okay. And basis of preparation, we have prepared in accordance with the accounting standard notified by the relevant authorities. You can simply, you can also add section 133 of the Companies Act <coughs> 2013, notified by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, etc. This note is actually talking about some IFRS. Maybe it's a, a copy paste error, which normally happens. And then comes, what is your uh, use of estimates? What is the judgments which you have made? with respect to what is the functional currency, what is the management judgment and the estimate which they have made, what are all the sources. This is what I have mentioned that for property plan equipment, what is the estimated use for life, from where they have got that estimated use for life, why they believe it, current tax computation based on tax laws and tax rates, deferred tax asset based on uh, the possibility of future profits, fair value measurement, how the management determines the assumptions, uh, what is the point at which the trade receivable is considered to be impaired? Uh, what is the impairment testing which for the non-financial assets like PPE? What is the defined benefit plans and other long-term employee benefits where the company makes some assumptions relating to the amount payable? And what is the fair value measurement relating to financial instruments? And what is the uh, assumptions made for provision contingencies? All those things. This I have actually not given as part of uh, the uh, slide and one of the requirement of index 1 is that in case if there are some new accounting pronouncement notified but not made mandatory for the current year assuming that we have prepared for the year ending 31st March 2019 and in that particular year, India's 116 was not notified. So we are trying to find out what is the impact of India's uh, 116 that the company has to make a disclosure. But of course, here 115 is also there, which is an again incorrect uh, presentation because this is for the year ended 31st March 2019. So it is already applied. So to that extent, the first one is actually incorrect. Uh, 116 which has been given is uh, correct. So whatever is the changes which has to be done. Suppose if there are some minor modification happened in certain standards that should also be part of it. I am just giving one example. Since it is a copy paste there are some errors which we are seeing. And uh, how the company determines the current assets and non-current asset that is also given as part of the significant accounting policy. All other significant accounting policy like fair value measurement, etc., etc., are also given. Fair value measurement, revenue recognition, revenue recognition for each stream, how the revenue being recognized, and what is the PPE, what is the 
uh, capital work in progress what is the uh, inventory policy so these are all regular policies but the the format in which we normally consider is that you should uh, normally look at giving the basis of preparation of the financial statement which should also have explicit and unreserved compliance with the statements applicable uh, significant accounting policy management judgment and assumptions what is the source for that a specific disclosure as per indas will be part of after the all the notes for example other expenses is the last note in the uh, indas financial statement for majority of the companies and after that all the disclosure for example uh, the disclosure relating to as2 what is the disclosure required uh, as uh, sorry indas2 inventories what is the disclosure required indas16 what is the disclosure required uh, if you are talking about fair value measurement in days 113 what is the disclosure required if you have uh, something called a related party transaction what is the disclosure required and all other statutory disclosure that's the way in which the notes on account should be there suppose if a company smartly says i will specifically disclose that i have not complied with a particular standard which is not comfortable to us for example financial instrument standard everybody finding it difficult can a company say that other than indias 109 and indias 32 all other standards have been applied but a non compliance by means of a disclosure cannot be cured so that should be explicit and unreserved statement of compliance so you cannot have a reservation in compliance that is what the standard says okay comparatives is normally one year comparatives but the third balance sheet can be given should be given i should use the word should be given in three circumstances where the company changes the accounting policy and applies it on a retrospective basis that's the reason why when a first time adopter is preparing the financial statement he changes the accounting policy on a retrospective basis right from the inception of the company that is the reason why the third balance sheet on the date of transaction is being given from i gap i am moving to uh, indias so there is a change in accounting policy which is applied on a retrospective basis so i am disclosing the third balance sheet suppose if there is an error that's what i have said if there is an accounting error which i am correcting in the current period i cannot simply do that i have to restate the item with a specific disclosure and a third balance sheet should be given as part of the financial statement pnl may not be required but the third balance sheet will be required but you have to explain what is the error before the error how that item has been disclosed in the previous year after this adjustment has been made what is the change so you have to give the detailed uh, disclosure and the third is suppose i am going to reclassify a particular item in the financial statement for example i wanted to reclassify a particular item as investment property on a retrospective basis not based on a new change in the management decision but it is an error again it's an error so because of that i am restating a balance on a retrospective basis again i have to give a third balance sheet and of course the second and the third is more or less similar normally when there is an error happens on restatement of an item that is you are remeasuring a item or when you are reclassifying an item you are only putting that in a different presentation side you are not doing any measurement in both the scenarios it's normally arising out of an error in the previous period in those cases you are expected to give the third balance sheet as well interestingly the standard says one year comparatives is required suppose if the management wants to give three year comparative two year comparative that means three years for example management believes i wanted to give a profit and loss count with current year previous year and year before previous year can it give interesting question the answer the standard says yes it is possible but interestingly what it says that that is uh, looking little funny only the pnl alone can be given for 
two comparative periods. That means three P&L account can be given for three periods. But the company, if desired, need not give other components of financial statement. So balance sheet can be only for the current period and the comparative period. Cash flow statement can be only for that two periods. Uh, the statement of changes in equity can also be only for the two period. The p and voluntarily company gives for the second comparative period. It can do that. But if they have given the third period p and Detailed disclosure relating to that should be forming part of the note. Otherwise, people could not understand or user cannot understand. So that's what it says. So that's the end of an elaborate discussion on how the financial statements will be prepared and presented in accordance with India S1. And we have also seen what is the prescription given in Schedule 3, Part 2, relating to India S1 financial statement and we have also seen the components of the financial statement a new component we have learned statement of changes in equity and we have also seen that the classification of an asset and liability is depending upon the management perspective and management intention but it should be demonstrated and we have also seen how the notes should be structured and given so that the user of the financial statement can actually understand I think I have uh, missed one point to add. Every line item in the statement of balance sheet, or so I should not use the word statement of balance sheet, sorry. Every line item of the balance sheet, every line item of the statement of profit and loss account should have a corresponding cross reference to a notes on account. That means a user, when he reads property plan equipment, will be linked or cross referred to a note. When he reads the note, he can understand what are all the composition of the uh, component relating to property plan equipment and how, what is the accumulated depreciation, etc. Similarly, if there is an intangible assets under development, there should be a cross reference to the note and it should be explained. So, similarly, profit and loss count sale of uh, goods that should be a cross reference sale of services that should be a cross reference other income a cross reference to a particular note similarly all expenses should be cross referred to a particular note the reason is india's believes that user of the financial statement should be given a complete understanding of the financial statement by means of <coughs> relevant disclosure reliable disclosure and transparency in the disclosure. So that is one of the key uh, important uh, uh, advantage of India's financial statements. So I think time again permitted to me to take the second session through uh, this uh, video. And the third, I will try to upload maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow depending upon the time uh, available because uh, converting the slides in accordance with the requirement of this software takes a little bit of time I, I spent more than two two and a half hours to make this presentation which was already available i have converted that according to the software so it took uh, it takes a little bit of time so i should be able to manage between the other work so uh, i will try to upload the next video maybe tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Uh, and as I have already told, any questions which you are having, you can actually go and send me an email or call me at any point of time uh, in the contact details which has been given. Uh, this will also be uploaded in YouTube. So you can share the link to your friends or your fellow of students who wanted to understand idea of this is the knowledge should be shared with as many people as possible and that's the reason why i'm spending uh, so much of time in preparing and presenting this uh, video lecture uh, without any uh, idea of making money out of it. it it's free of cost only for as a knowledge sharing with all uh, professionals as well as students and you can uh, 
please share the link to others who you believe that it will be useful to them. So thank you so much. And let me uh, thank you for all your patient hearing. And let me uh, come back to you with the next series of this presentation. Thank you so much.